everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this discussion on the implications of digital related issues at MC13 and beyond. Uh, my name is Risha Bailey, I'm a research director at Public Citizen, a consumer rights organization based in Washington, D.C., with uh, half a million members and supporters. Founded in 1971, Public Citizen works to protect consumer and people's rights in a range of different sectors, from healthcare and access to medicines, to climate, justice, and international trade. Uh, as part of Public Citizen Global Trade Watch team, I work as a research director for the Digital Trade Alliance, a network of digital rights uh, and consumer groups from around the world that aims to empower consumer and digital rights groups to engage with, with trade policy. Um, as you're no doubt aware, the MC30 negotiations will touch on a range of issues critical to how governments are able to govern the digital ecosystem. One of the most important issues that will be debated over the next few days is the renewal of the moratorium. Hello. I can I can just make myself laugh. Yeah, uh, is the renewal of the moratorium on uh, imposing tariffs on electronic transmissions. Uh, while the moratorium has been in place, uh, with a few exceptions, for nearly two decades, it's increasingly faced opposition from developing countries who point to the need for policy space to craft their digital industrial policies, as well as the impact of the moratorium in, redu in reducing the tools available to tax the digital economy. This, amongst other uh, digital-related issues at the WTO, have typically been really contentious, which has led to a number of countries to begin negotiating their own set of digital trade-related rules under the rubric of the Plurilateral Joint Statement Initiative on e-commerce, outside the mandated work program on e-commerce in the WTO. While the JSI claims to have reached consensus on several issues, including e-signatures, e-contracts, online consumer protection, and so on, the 21st February 2024 text does not include language on source code, cross-border data flows, and non-discrimination, some of the more contentious issues in the digital trade space. The JSI process also assumes that a consensus of members will agree to its adoption as a WTO agreement, despite strong opposition to this JSI and JSIs generally as unmandated and likely to marginalize other issues of importance to developing countries in particular. Uh, so in today's discussion, we will try and explore the role that the WTO, a trade body, should play with respect to digital governments, and what processes should be implemented to ensure transparent and equitable decision making. We'll also examine where the JSI and e-commerce moratorium stand legally and substantively, and the implications of these for consumers, workers, and governments aiming to regulate the digital space. So to discuss these issues, we're, we're joined today uh, by a wonderful panel of experts. To my immediate left is Sophia Scassera. Uh, Sophia is an associate researcher with the Transnational Institute and specializes on digital economy, labor, and development. She's an advisor on international trade and the future of employment at the International Affairs Secretariat of the Argentine Federation of Trade and Service Employees. She also serves as a researcher and lecturer at the Institute of the World of Work, Julia Odio, of the UNTREF, and is an advisor at the National Senate in Argentina. Thank you uh, for being here, Sophia. Uh, Next, we have Melanie Foley as Deputy Director of Global Trade Watch Team at Public Citizen. Melanie leads outreach and coalition building uh, strategies to bolster campaigns on global trade negotiations, such as the Indo-Pacific Economic Partnership, and the global movement to roll back damaging international economic structures, such as invested state dispute settlement regimes. She's also the US co-chair of the Trade Policy Committee of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. To the left of Melanie, we have Jane Kelsey, Jane is Emeritus Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Auckland, New Zealand. While she's worked extensively in a number of areas, including related to indigenous rights and domestic policy, her trade-related work has focused on the interface between globalization and neoliberalism, with particular reference to free trade and investment agreements at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels. She also provides a range of pro bono training, advisory, and advocacy services to governments in the Global South, indigenous Maori, trade unions, and non-government organizations. Then to Jane's left is Daniel Rangel. Uh, Daniel is a research director of the Regional Trade Program at the American Economic uh, Liberties Project. He has a decade of experience working on trade law and policy and authored major reports on digital trade, WTO law, labor aspects of trade agreements, and the distribution of outcomes of trade deals. And finally, at the end of the show, we have Sanya Reed smith uh, Sanya is a legal advisor and senior researcher at the Third World Network, an international coalition specializing in development issues and North-South affairs. Her work focuses on analyzing human rights and development implications of trade and investment <coughs> for developing and least developed countries. 
thank you all for making time to join us today for what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. Uh, and with that, I'd like to kick things off, uh, if I may, with a question to Jane on the broader issue surrounding the legitimacy of the GSI. Uh, Jane, you previously argued against joint statement processes, not least due to the fact that the WTO typically makes decisions based on consensus. Some have, however, argued that the progress in the WTO has not necessarily always been by consensus. So, for instance, in the development of anti-dumping codes or limited membership agreements on issues such as telecom and financial services. How do you respond to arguments that a unilateral framework may represent a means to achieve some level of understanding on what are critical issues, given also that the e-commerce JSI includes countries that typically have very, very different views, such as the China, such as China and the US? <coughs> Thank you. Oh, no. No. Okay. Um, my students always said my voice was too loud for a microphone. So, uh, thank you for coming, um, and thank you for for the question. Um, one of the things that has concerned me throughout the discussions around JSIs is the playing fast and loose with history and fact. Uh, one of those is about the history of plurilaterals. Uh, as if what we are seeing now with these breakaway negotiations uh, since the 2017 Buenos Aires Ministerial, uh, a, a suggestion that that's nothing new. Well, if we look at the existing plurilateral agreements, we see that they are fundamentally different. Uh, there are several plurilateral agreements that were negotiated during the time of the old GATT that were carried through into the WTO by consensus. There were several elements in the Uruguay round negotiations, for example, financial services and telecommunications that are often referred to, um, that are plurilateral in relation to those specific sectors. They were mandated. They were mandated, the bodies they were to be conducted through were mandated, the procedures and the mechanisms for their adoption were mandated. The um, ITA um, <coughs> is probably the only um, plurilateral that we can point to since the WTO was created and that was dealing with trade in IT goods, and it was adopted legitimately by amending the schedules on goods uh, in the manner that was mandated uh, in, uh, in the WTO. And so what we've seen in these breakaway JSIs, including on e-commerce, uh, is one, no mandate for them, two, not conducted through the, the authorised bodies for conducting negotiations. Um, and now, and in the case of e-commerce, in parallel to a mandated process under the 1998 work programme on e-commerce to be conducted through the formal bodies of the WTO, Council for Trade and Services, Council for Trade and Goods, the Intellectual Property Council and the Committee for Trade and Development. Um, and, and so what we're seeing basically, and, and the Director General likes this term, reform by doing, which means basically breaking all the rules. And then trying to work out how you get those adopted when you haven't actually complied with any of the formal rules of the WTO. So more briefly on, on, on your questions about the diversity of interests and so on, um, we've seen some interesting shifts occur through the, these negotiations. Um, as those of you who, who follow e-commerce will know, the original template uh, was developed by the US Trade Representative uh, based on big text, what was known as the digital two dozen principles uh, pursued through the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
agreement negotiations, where the negotiator, uh, Robert Holliman, had spent 23 years as the president of the Software Alliance uh, in the US, so literally big tech negotiating those rules for itself. Um, and they attempted then to take that into the trade and services agreement negotiations. That got stalled in part because of precisely this diversity. The US versus the EU, not able to agree. Now China wasn't in there because they blocked China. So it's not surprising that when we see this WTO negotiation, we've got all sorts of tensions underpinning that that carry over from those earlier stages. And if you look at the, the text even before the US dropped its bombshell late last year, you'll see that there are wide divergences. Um, the developing countries, of whom there are a few in there, have tried to carve out some space for themselves. Uh, Nigeria has tried to uh, have an exception on data rules. Uh, Côte d'Ivoire has tried to have a carve out completely for developing countries just to comply with whatever they can comply with. The text that was released in January and then again in uh, earlier this week does not include any of those developing country um, uh, exceptions. And nor does it include, of course, the US's um, proposed uh, data rules, and it was the US that proposed them, the rules on data, the rules on source code, um, and so uh, what we have now is this very interesting e-commerce light agreement, but which still carries many of the problems uh, from before. So I don't think we can assume um, that uh, this in any way reflects the diversity even of the participants who are in the negotiation, let alone those that aren't. Uh, thanks, Jane. So having sort of set the stage as well on the broader JSI process, maybe we could jump into some of the specific issues that the JSI currently deals with. Uh, so I'd like to maybe move to Sanya next. Um, so the latest JSI text um, allows developing countries an extended period to implement some of the obligations in the agreement. Um, it also <coughs> contains certain provisions regarding capacity building and non-application of dispute settlement mechanisms for MDCs for a period of seven years. Um, however, as Jane also mentioned, the text excludes exceptions previously proposed by Nigeria and the Ivory Coast for developing countries and LDCs. Uh, could you briefly explain the importance of these provisions and whether these exceptions could still be included? Yeah, so of course the text is not closed, so exceptions can be added. Um, but the question is whether those kinds of exceptions would be sufficient. Because if you just take one example of uh, the kinds of rules that seem to already be agreed in the JSI commerce and also comes up in some free trade agreements like the African Continental Free Trade Area, um, is this deregulation of electronic authentication. So that is where um, the governments are required to leave it to the companies and the consumers to decide how secure their electronic transactions are. So it's hands-off deregulation. But that means that a lot of existing regulations in, develop in developing countries are not possible. So for example, because of market failures, governments step in and require two-factor authentication for online banking. Or that when you use your credit card in a supermarket, they don't send your credit card number unencrypted to their head office and then it's stolen and they go shopping with your credit card. Um, they require privacy protections, like when hospitals' data is stored on the cloud, it's encrypted so people's personal health records are not uh, obtained. And they require encryption of your identity number in transit, like the social security number, like many US states do. Or um, in the US, for example, they didn't require certain minimum levels of cybersecurity for critical infrastructure like oil and gas pipelines, unlike Canada. And then your colonial pipeline was hacked because it didn't use two-factor authentication. And, and you remember um, that there was a, a ransomware that had to pay $4.4 million in ransom and that it was shut down for the first time in 57 years, causing shortages across the East Coast. So um, there's also requirements in the US, of course, that the hospitals and the health insurance companies use the same IT system so they're interoperable and you don't have to retype all the bills and everything. That's also not possible under this. There is an exception you know, for one category of transactions and you choose one to save. In the EU, um, they have common requirements to use, uh, so their, their banking systems are interoperable and encryption requirements also are not permitted. So a transition period is not going to help you with that. And the standard WTO exceptions for health and environment also don't help for things like efficiency of hospital records to lower you know, prices. Um, or, and the security exception, which is the standard WTO one, doesn't cover cybersecurity. 
so it doesn't cover hacks on pipelines in times of peace. Um, so these kinds of exceptions are not sufficient, and this is a fast-moving area of technology. So, you know, today we see algorithms and big data used in this much. You know, tomorrow it'll be this much, and in five years it'll be this much, and so we can't predict the kinds of regulations we need. Even USTR Thai has said that you know the regulations are trying to catch up with the technology, but what we see in these rules is that they restrict your ability to regulate in a fast-moving area of technology, and the exceptions are the old ones from the 1945 GATT, and they haven't been updated for today and for cybersecurity, and the time-limited transition periods are not going to help you deal with an ongoing problem that restricts your policy in this space. So it's not too late. Further exceptions can be added. We've seen best practices, for example, in some US free trade agreements where they have self-judging security exceptions um, that gives you a bit more flexibility, but that's not what we see in the current JSI context. Uh, so if I could just actually ask, you know, you to build on a point that you mentioned, I mean, you, you refer to the provisions on e-authentication and e-signatures. I mean, typically these seem fairly, well, they really kind of shut us down. Because they first cut the microphone, then they cut the glass, <laughs> <laughs> now they cut, then, then they cut the, 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 the air conditioner, and now the lights. It's like, yeah. Is going to fall <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like kicking us out. This is the latest strategy. We have a colleague checking in on the yeah. situation. Yeah. Great. Maybe the whole building is out. Right. Should I tell the lady something or you're asking? Thank you. Hopefully, we get some lights soon. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead now. Yeah, so uh, Sanya, you had mentioned uh, some of the implications of these e authentication and e signature, e contracts related provisions. I mean, which seem fairly anodyne on their surface. I mean, what impact, though, do you think that they actually have, particularly on developing countries who are still you know, developing digital infrastructure? Yeah, and so um, in addition to the e-signatures one, there's often provisions, uh, for example, that your contract should all be electronic. And we see this in the ACFTA as well, for example. And there's a lot of reasons why you might have paper contracts, like buying and selling a house. It's pretty serious. You don't want to just have an electronic click and that's it, your house is gone. Um, and in some countries, some essential services are also crucial. So they say for essential services like water, you can't just click and agree to some unaffordable price. You know, it has to be a paper contract so the consumer takes it more seriously. In some developing countries, they collect stamp duty on certain transactions and they can only be collected on paper. So if you have an electronic contract to sell your car or to buy a car, they don't have the system to collect stamp duty on it when it's electronic. So, you know, let's make everything electronic. Sure, but it has a lot of other implications depending on the country's capacities. Um, and so maybe one example of this is if we look at the moratoriums, um, which is both made permanent or proposed to make permanent in the JSI e-commerce, but of course it's coming up for renewal here in MC13 for all WTO members. Um, and this also appears in some free trade agreements in more or less impossible ways. But, uh, you know, some people say, well, don't worry about this moratorium on uh, electronic transition, downloading e-books and movies and video games and music, because, you know, it's just a small proportion of your revenue. But, um, you know, we know that developing countries, at least developed countries, rely on tariffs as a source of revenue much more than, say, the OECD. And so an UNCTAD study uh, by the United Nations found that about 95% of the revenue loss due to this moratorium is borne by developing countries. So for the 44 developing countries that she had data for, this moratorium cost them 14 billion US dollars in revenue in 2020 alone. For the 12 least developed countries with data, it cost them 680 million US dollars in revenue in 2020. Some developing countries east lost more than a billion US dollars in revenue. So that's quite big, you know, you can buy a lot of COVID vaccines for that price. And as more becomes digitized and there's fewer you know, physical CDs and DVDs coming across the border and disks of computer software, then this has a bigger and bigger impact. But it's not just on revenue, it's also the trade balance. A lot of developing countries have chronic trade balance problems and they want to raise the import tariffs on luxury products like video games to try and reduce their import burden and improve their balance of payments. That's also uh, prevented by this. And it impacts digital industrialization. And so, the ones who benefit the most from this moratorium, you know, 76% of the exports of these products, like films and songs and ebooks, are from developed countries. Developing countries, apart from China, only export 5%, and least developed countries, not even 1%. And so, who benefits from this are the companies like Netflix, YouTube, Facebook, and so on, who are 80% of these transmissions. Um, and so, what happens then is, you know, even if you have a transition period, that's not enough if it's in the JSI commerce. Um, if it's renewed here for all countries, it's quite shocking to me because 
Uh, it, we're still in the current Doha development round. It hasn't ended, it hasn't been concluded. And in that round, least developed countries are not supposed to have to reduce their tariffs. And yet this moratorium requires them to have zero tariffs on these products exported by developed countries, while developed countries are not reducing their tariffs on exports from LDCs and developing countries. So it's quite counter to the, to the Doha development round. Um, if I may come to Daniel next. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, the JSI text contains provisions for consumer protection. I mean, parties must adopt measures to stop misleading, fraudulent, deceptive commercial activities. There are also provisions about spam and so on. Do you think these provisions actually go far enough to protect consumers? And how would you like to see them improved? So for instance, you've written extensively about the right to repair, for instance. Um, could, you, could you please explain that? Thank you, Risha, for organizing the event and for the question. Um, I will start by saying that I think that the notion of, ha of having international commitments in which countries agree to protect consumers while they are engaging in e-commerce <coughs> activities, that's potentially good. Uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with having countries cooperating in this. Um, the question with regards to consumers, I think the big question is whether when you look at the digital trade agenda and all of the rules that have been proposed in these uh, in these kind of negotiations, whether consumers are going to be left better off or worse off uh, when you look at all of the rules. And there, the right to repair is a good example. So policymakers around the world have been very interested lately in guaranteeing that people and independent repair shops have the tools, information, and parts that are necessary to, for people or independent repair shops to conduct repair. And that you don't have to take your phone to a Mac store in order to get a screen change or something like that. Um, and there are certain policies that have been adopted in the US, mainly at the state level, but also there are policies in the EU that they're not called right to repair, but they're called eco design systems uh, requirements that basically they uh, mandate on manufacturers to share these kind of tools. Now, in an increasingly digital world, these tools are often software related. And some of these tools could be like, for instance, the diagnostic software that's necessary to conduct repair, or even the firmware, which is the piece of code that permits one component to match to the device. All of those elements are uh, included in the definition of source code and algorithms. That is a rule that has been included in a handful of digital trade agreements. And what this rule basically does is to limit the capacity of governments to require firms to require to share or make available source code or algorithms defined in a very loose manner. So as I said, in an increasingly digital world, this could really affect the effectiveness of right to repair policies. And this is just to give an example of how, even though uh, we have consumer protection in these deals, we think like, yeah, governments have to protect consumers from spam and fraud, which is good. And uh, overall, there are other elements of these agreements that are very problematic for the consumer. Thanks. Um, I'd like to now sort of switch focus slightly and go to Melody. Um, the US recently announced that because we all know that it was withdrawing support for controversial provisions in the JSI. Uh, what, to your mind, prompted this change and how is it likely to affect nego uh, negotiations around the JSI? Uh, will this, as is being claimed by a lot of uh, people in the US, present an opportunity for more authoritarian countries uh, to take the lead in laying down the rules of the road? Thank you, thank you for that. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all um, events like these seem to be one of the few sanctioned ways that NGOs are able to share our analyses uh, with you all and the views of the co communities that we represent. I'm sure most of you will have heard about the um, you know, silencing of CSO voices that has been happening thus far in the ministerial. Um, we have some information about that on the table outside in addition to lots of papers about the digital trade issues that we're here to discuss. And I'll leave those out there for you to pick up on your own because apparently I can't hand them to you. Um, so back to the question, and I think there are 
two answers to that question, and one is more historical. You know, this uh, recent move by the U.S. is part of a, a history um, recently of the U.S. You know, moving away from some of the you know more traditional free trade rules that we've seen have created issues both for um, you know folks around the world as well as for consumers and working people in the United States. And so, you know, those communities, um, uh, unions and environmental organizations and civil society has been raising for the past couple of decades, you know, the, the documented harms of this model of trade um, that stems in part from, you know, secretive uh, negotiating uh, practices that uh, keep the people who will be infected from being part of the creation of those rules. And um, so, you know, throughout his presidency, um, Biden and Ambassador Tai have been talking about worker-centered trade, and this move is, you know, part of what we're starting to see that vision is uh, going to become. And so the, the second answer to that is, you know, more immediate, you know, what created this particular decision. And I think it's part of, you know, multiple levels of the U.S. government starting to reckon with the problem of you know, big tech monopoly power over our economy. And so you know, this was in consultation with other agencies that you know, USTR decided that the Trump era proposals uh, were no longer worthy of support by the US. Um, and so you know, and to the last part of your question, you know, the, the argument about ceding control to China is a very common tactic used in U.S. political discourse. Um, but folks here, I'm sure, will know that it, our, the argument doesn't make much sense. Um, you know, China is part of the JSI discussions. Any agreement that is reached there will you know, presumably have their support. So you know, it doesn't really make sense that the U.S. abandoning this position would, would somehow uh, cede that. Uh, additionally, you know, the U.S. is still part of those negotiations. They've removed support for these particular provisions, but have not left the table by any means. Um, so, you know, the, the U.S. position change on data flows and source code um, has been applauded by dozens of U.S. members of Congress, including some uh, people who, or who are the leaders of important committees and leadership in Congress small business groups, uh, human rights and civil rights organizations. So this is definitely a step in the right direction and a diverse range of stakeholders look forward to seeing more of it. Uh, thanks, so actually on a similar issue, I'd like to go back to Daniel if I may. Um, we've seen how the US has sort of changed its position, but at the same time, there's, a, there's been this news recently that the US could implement an executive order that could limit data flows uh, to certain countries of concern. Uh, could you provide some background on this? And do you see other countries also looking to adopt such instruments? Also, how do you see this as affecting negotiations on uh, data flow provisions at, in, in spaces like the JSI? I think it's very clear that the main driver, the main factor, as Melanie said, of the US decision to withdraw support from these terms on data flows, data storage, and source code is the need to preserve policy space. Uh, and that is related with data security, uh, but also could be related to privacy legislation, with AI, all sorts of soft that are very important in the digital world. So certainly there are conversations within the Biden administration to establish certain rules that will limit data flows uh, of sensitive information uh, that could go to a specific countries based on security concerns. And that will be certainly at odds with the data flows obligations that have been proposed in, this, in the context of the JSI, but that are also part of the, part of the discussion in other agreements. Um, I think that it's possible that other countries could adopt similar measures, but I think that even more importantly is that regulation of data transfers could have different motivations and different drivers. So while well, we're talking about data security in this case, are all, there are other countries that have regulated data transfers based on protecting privacy, personal data, health data, accounting data, there are all sorts of 
reasons to regulate data flows, uh, development. So, in a way, what is important is to take into account that the exceptions that have been built into these proposals probably don't give enough policy space for countries to be able to meet all of these policy objectives. This is basically so because they have been constructed on the same structure that has been used for the GATS and the GATS exceptions that have shown to not give enough policy space for countries that have tried to defend their public interest policies under those measures. So when I was back at Public Citizen, I did a study in which we basically went through all of the cases at the WTO that have, in which countries have tried to use the exceptions, and only in two cases, the WTO adjudicating bodies say, okay, the requirements to use some of these exceptions are met, and you can proceed with your policy. So building over that failure of the WTO to grant enough policy space is a critical mistake. And in that sense, I think that that kind of lesson should really inform whatever discussion on data flows that we're gonna have in the future. Um, Jane, if I may sort of come to you and ask you to put on the seer's hat, as it were. Um, given these sort of contradictions within the JSI process itself, um, what are your thoughts, I mean, what do you think is likely to happen with respect to the finalization of the JSI? Is it likely to go through, I mean, We've seen how process is used or misused in, in, in a number of WTO spaces. Your thoughts? If, if we just look at the last three iterations of the texts, well, maybe if we look at, at, at four, right? We had the comprehensive one that was similar to the really expansive uh, e-commerce rules in the various uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and various others, US MCA and so on. Then we had this confused chairs text uh, after the US dropped its bombshell about um, about data and source code. And then we had a January text and one at the beginning of this week, which were are uh, this e-commerce light. And there is a, a, a worrying sense around the place that somehow uh, this one is, is not a problem. And uh, so for those who are interested, I've done an analysis of it that, that shows why it is a problem. Um, but there are areas, important areas, that are still not agreed. And because this is a chair's text, it is not the party's text. It glosses over the ongoing points of disagreement. And we don't know, for example, how some countries that will be asked to support this feel about some of those rules. And let me just give you one example. There is a proposed rule that a party, when they adopt this e-commerce light agreement, can not apply it to certain named other parties. So that means the US, if it proceeds, could say we're not going to apply this to China. Likewise, the reverse. We don't know how China feels about that. We don't know um, quite what, what the sense of things is. So it's very hard to assess from the chair's text that we've got at present how controversial this is even amongst the parties. And especially because there's no development uh, exceptions in there, we have no idea as well where the developing countries are. So what might they do to try to adopt it? Well, there are three options. One is they could try to have it added to the menu of the main agreements in the WTO the GATT, the GATS, the TRIPS, um, the Trade Facilitation Agreement, and try to add it. But to do that, they need consensus. And clearly there is not a consensus amongst the membership, even if there is amongst those uh, who, who have negotiated it. And so there is a dilemma about how to do that, especially if 
there is uh, a rule in there that says that what we call most favoured nation status does not apply. That is, if it only applies amongst the parties to the agreement, which is what it's currently saying. And that's a problem to do it in that first way. The second way is that they might try to do it as a plurilateral agreement that applies only amongst those countries. There we have the problem that we have with investment facilitation this week, that it can ex only be adopted exclusively by consensus of all of the members. That is not going to happen because of major concerns about the systemic consequences of cherry-picking the issues that are to be negotiated by plurilaterals and outside the formal mandated processes and bodies. And whilst we have yet to see what kind of shenanigans will be used to try and adopt IF here, um, it will be even more problematic, I think, to try and adopt it by um, uh, on e commerce. The third option is to try to do what they have done with the services domestic regulation reference paper and try to adopt it by unilaterally amending country schedules. But the difficulty is whereas services domestic regulation was only about services and they could try to do it in the GATS schedules and there's a press conference happening about that now and it's not actually what they're saying but that's another matter. Um, but in e-commerce, you've got a range of, of new rules that aren't just about services and aren't just about goods and amending the GATT schedule. So that option is deeply problematic as well. But what we are seeing, to go back to this playing fast and loose with the rules, is that um, there's a mentality about, well, let's just do this and conclude the agreement and then we'll work out how to get it into the WTO once we've done that. Um, and if they can try and create some precedents with domestic regulation and with uh, investment facilitation, uh, then they're going to be assuming that whatever JSIs, including e-commerce, uh, are done uh, will somehow manage to be adopted. Um, and that will create big problems for developing countries in compliance because the rules on compliance that they have here allow developing countries to categorise three different categories of the rules and say which ones they'll adopt straight away, which ones they need a bit more time and which ones they'll adopt when they've got the resources to do it. But it's incredibly tight time frames. And there's a whole lot of notifications involved with that that are hugely burdensome for any developing countries that would sign on to it. And, and so I, I think we've, um, we've got really difficult precedent setting issues here about the impacts on developing countries of allowing the adoption of this as well. Right, so uh, talking about the impact on, of, on developing countries, I think one of the key issues that uh, Sanya also touched on earlier is the e-commerce moratorium. So I'd like to sort of go to Sophia now, sorry for taking so much time to come to you, but uh, now the JSI text uh, pertaining to the moratorium defines an electronic transmission as a transmission made using electronic electromagnetic means and includes the content of the transmission. Uh, Many developing countries have previously opposed inclusion of content within the scope of the moratorium. So could you briefly explain the problems with, with this and also how does the moratorium now apply to digitized services and what could the possible problems be to developing countries? Okay, so what we have to take into account is that when you have the distinction between products and services, Historically, it was a little bit more easy to do so. But with intangible goods like movies or music that can be downloaded, those distinctions are a little bit tricky and they are a little bit hard to do. So we need to redefine what a product and a service is inside the WTO. That's the first thing that we need to recognize. So the moratorium belongs only to products 
Um, but the problem is that sometimes it is hard now to set the barrier between a product and a service when we have all these digital products coming out and what does it really mean, a digital product, and how can it be um, categorized in the different uh, uh, WTO um, categories of products and services. So this is the first issue. So many countries have argued that the moratorium should not include the content of the transmission, for example, Argentina, Indonesia, there are many countries who are doing this. And there's a historical debate around that because when you think about it, when you export, um, a, a, for example, a, a, a music CD, well, it was hard to tax the content of the music CD because that means that in customs, they have to start listening the songs that included that CD. And that doesn't make any sense. You just tax the CD, which was the means of carrying that uh, music. But in digital services and products, that's not the case, it's totally different. So actually platforms uh, that they sell these products online can actually actively help the tax authorities to raise taxes because they know exactly what's inside the content of that transmission. They do, they know the, the platforms. So instead of trying to see how we can take advantage of that for countries, they're saying, okay, no, let's just not tax anything. So some countries start saying, no, it's fine if you don't want to tax ones and zeros, like the data or whatever, so the means, but let's tax what's inside that data. No, let's tax um, what it contains, that electronic transmission, which is a better approach in, the, in digital products and services, not to tax the data, but to tax the content of the data. So it's, the debate changed now. Uh, with the, with the digital economy and the digital sphere. So that debate can be resolved now and platforms can play a huge role helping resolve that and for the tax authority to be easier to raise taxes on products and services that they want to target. And this is an important thing because when we think about it, if we just say, okay, any product or any digital service is included in the moratorium, that means that many countries who have historically defend some products and protect some products, now they will have to liberalize those. So for example, if you say, okay, I'm not, I'm taxing movies because I want to protect my movie industry, you know, for example, and you just like say, okay, the moratorium applies to all movies, then you're saying, okay, if it's a digital product being sold, being sold, that means that the protection that you put in your GATT does not, does not, uh, is not included in the, uh, when it's a digital product. So it's kind of tricky because if you think about it now, every product becomes digitalized and, uh, and most services are sell online. So it's kind of tricky because you're actually saying everything that you've already protected in the GATT is not protected anymore. So it is really useful to start getting out of the moratorium the content so countries can still protect the products that historically they protected in the GATT. So it's like saying, okay, if you have a product protected, it's still protected under the moratorium and it's still protected even if it's a digital product. Because for us, it's the same, it's the same industry. So I think, um, I think countries have the right to tax products to protect their own industry because that's the whole point about border taxes. I mean, we are in the WTO, we all know that border taxes, the whole point about it is to protect your own industry or to control the prices inside the country or to have some kind of policy space in order to uh, do that. And it's not only about a leverage of taxes, it's not only about revenue, it's also about controlling and uh, designing your domestic economy and your domestic policy in order to benefit some parts of your economy and some parts of the employment that you want to raise because it's important for your industrialization. So I think that extending the moratorium to the content will mean that many things that were protected by countries are not protected anymore. So that's why I think it's okay for some countries to start raising concerns about not including the content of the moratorium and it will be so helpful if platforms will help 
doing this in order to have a more fair economy and a more um, an economy that it's uh, that it has the right policy space for countries to design their own internal markets. So sticking uh, with the moratorium, Sophia, I mean, uh, I'd like your thoughts on some of two important arguments that are made by proponents of the Bumpus moratorium. I mean, first it's argued that uh, a failure to extend the moratorium could affect small and medium enterprises <coughs> in developing countries, particularly those run by women. Uh, it's also argued that the moratorium benefits consumers because it keeps prices low. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on these two arguments? Well, I think that's, a, that's a, another tricky argument because they say that it will put prices low if we keep going with the moratorium, but at the same time they're saying in some studies, oh, it's not so much revenue anyways. So it's like kind of like, okay, just get yourself together and do one argument. You can't argue with the two ways. But the good thing is that they don't forbid the VAT, so the, 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 the tax that is raised inside. So it's not about a, a price problem. If uh, countries will really care about prices, and if the WTO will really care about prices, then the VIT will be the problem. Uh, the fact that they are extending the moratorium, they're pushing for the moratorium, is not a price issue, and it's not for benefiting consumers, because anyways, countries already do VIT on Netflix and Spotify and, and, and lots of streaming services and stuff. So. What it's, this is really about is about getting market access from a handful of corporations, international corporations, that they want to get inside their market and have the same playing field as the national corporations that they're working inside. And again, I know that we're in the WTO and everybody loves market access and everybody loves that everybody plays with the same rules inside of your markets, but the truth is that this is a policy space that, that countries have and if you have a, um, a sector that you want to protect or that you have a national interest in it, you should have the right to say, no, I'm protecting this, and therefore I raise customs duties on this specific product or services that are sold online, and, and, and the rest doesn't. So, so I think it's important to distinguish that because if it was only a price matter, then why are we putting VIT, that is an internal uh, tax, that is for everyone. So it's not, um, I want to debunk the, the argument of just like, this is so important for consumers because it will lower the prices, because actually it's not happening that, and we still have the moratorium. Actually, it is not happening. Thank you. So um, I'd like to now sort of focus on some of the broader issues uh, regarding the system and digital trade rules, so I'd like to come back to Daniel if I could. Um, now, the concept of non-discrimination, which we've touched on briefly, I mean, treating similar products from different uh, countries similarly, and similar products from foreign and domestic origin similarly, is considered one of the basic pillars of the WTO framework. Uh, some of your work, however, points to how this concept is being utilized by big tech in particular to frustrate domestic regulation of the digital ecosystem. Uh, could you briefly explain how this is being done and I'll try to be brief, but it's not a brief story. So, uh, it's true, non-discrimination is basically as old as trade agreements. Um, and going back into history, we have to remember that the whole idea of having a non-discrimination rule, which started with most favorite nations, eventually evolved into also included national treatment, is to protect those tariff concessions or other type of concessions that countries were giving each other in the term when they were negotiating a trade agreement. And the idea was, well, if you are if you are giving me a benefit, then you cannot undo it, but then giving another country the same benefit of a, of a better one, and that's most favorite nation national treatment, is if you are then giving me a benefit, like reducing a tariff, but at the same time, uh, you're raising an internal tax. So that's the main idea of how non-discrimination started in trade law. But when countries were negotiating the GATT in 1947, they expanded this concept to cover non-fiscal measures. So that's basically regulation. And then we get into a very tricky problem in which is how do we distinguish when regulation is actually protectionist or not? Uh, and for decades, 
trained scholars have discussed this, and there are basically two positions. One say, some of them say, you should look at the intent of the measure, you should, you should look if policymakers actually want to be protectionist or not, or you should look at the effects, what happens in practice, uh, considering the characteristics of the product or of the service. Eventually, when the WTO came into E and the appellate body was set up, and there were a bunch of cases that went into that discussion in which the WTO bodies basically said, you need to look at effects. The intent of a measure is not relevant in order to determine if it's protectionist or not, and if it violates national treatment. So, Going back to digital, this is problematic because what we're seeing, as, as we have said, uh, these markets are extremely concentrated. There are few players that dominate, and then the response from policymakers has been, we need to do rules that are targeted for the, for the big guys. And this is basically, they have criteria and thresholds that are based on market power and on size. And we have another wrinkle there, and is that most of these companies happen to be based in the US. So you can see where I'm going because it has been very easy for, um, for big tech companies and for industry associations that represent them to say these are not competition policies, these are trade barriers, these are, these are discriminatory measures that have to be removed. And we're talking here about the EU Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act. Korea has an App Store bill that basically targets the two app stores that are, that are actually in the market. Uh, and digital services taxes, and also the measures that basically try to make sure that there some of the ad revenue that platforms like Google and Facebook make uh, so some of the revenue has to be shared with media companies. Uh, and we are all see, and we have seen this, that argument say this is discriminatory, this is a trade barrier, this has to be removed. So that's the big problem. And the problem in digital trade that the reason why this hasn't grown out of proportions is because there's there are not a lot of commitments right there about <laughs> non-discrimination for digital products. You have that rule in 30 agreements or so, and it was proposed for the JSI, and it was one of the few rules at the JSI that was only proposed by the US, and it didn't have any other supporter. And that, that's very self-explanatory by itself, because a lot of countries said, like, maybe I'm not in a position to negotiate this role with the US in and 90 other countries. So uh, that's the risk, and that's something that has to be taken into account whenever uh, any policymaker or negotiator is engaged with the question of non discrimination for the digital. Uh, thanks. So, uh, finally, coming to Melvin, I mean, Daniel mentioned some measures aimed at uh, big tech jurisdictions such as the EU and so on. But there's also been increasing interest in the US to regulate uh, big tech companies. Given the domestic politics, the pushback from industry, and the fact that it was an election year, is the US in a position to adopt a more progressive agenda regarding digital trade? And um, are we likely to see an alternative agenda be uh, proposed by the administration anytime in the near future? Well, um, you know, with my crystal ball, I'll try to tell you. I mean, in an election year, things are always a huge question mark for in the US around trade policy. Um, and I think even more so right now because of the moment we're in. Um, you know, Jane called the recent US decision a bombshell, and I think that's right, um, but only because the USTRs of both parties for the past few decades have you know, obediently done the bidding of the biggest companies. Um, and so I think it's important for you know, delegates here to know that the, the tech industry is furious uh, and the pushback has been intense, um, but media <coughs> reports about that industry pushback have not fully reflected the support that exists for these positions. Um, for trade and other policies to rein in the power of big tech. And so I mentioned some of these groups earlier, um, but these are politically important constituencies. And so uh, I think aside from this uh, rethink being the right choice policy-wise, it may also be the right choice politically. Um, you know, so will we see a more progressive U.S. digital trade agenda? Um, you know, I think we already are. And you know, while I recognize that this is not 
currently the U.S. position, uh, it would be in keeping with that ongoing rethink of the old model to also abandon you know, support for the econ moratorium tax holiday for big tech. Um, so this is certainly contested space. Um, Interagency discussions are ongoing, and it's unclear exactly where that will lead. Thanks. Um, thank you all for your comments. And with your permission, um, I'd like to now open the floor for any questions or comments. Um, I'll maybe take a couple of questions and then uh, pass it on. Hi, uh, Brett Fordham from Inside US Trade. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand uh, a, a couple of points. Um, first, um, on, on the broader negotiating dynamic um, on the e-commerce moratorium, um, I, I guess I kind of wonder, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's so much uh, developing uh, versus developed. I'm just going through some of the, the proposals um, in, in their, uh, the ACP proposal I thought was particularly interesting because it, it, it's trying to thread a needle <coughs> Of you know, let's absolutely talk about the, some of the definitional issues that um, have arisen um, in in recent years, but extend the moratorium till till MC14. So I was wondering if um, you could talk about is the negotiating dynamic here different um, than previous ministerials um, in, in terms of the arguments, um, not just for extending the moratorium, um, but for you know, some uh, countries still not wanting that extension. And second, um, <clears throat> because the, the moratorium is kind of a, a status quo argument, I, I, wanna, I, I don't think I, I completely understand your, your point on the, the need to, to liberalize. Um, is, is that because some physical goods are, have become digital goods, so that there's obviously that, that loss of revenue? Um, uh, but um, I, I, I guess I, I just want to make sure I, I, I understand the, the, the point about um, if there's the renewal of the moratorium, that there there might be a need for some countries to, to liberalize in, in some areas. Well, I will start with that one. No, what I meant is that so so you might happen to have a, a product that you protected in your tax agreement. For example, you protected I don't know music, or you protected books, or you protected whatever. And if you say the moratorium is extended and includes the content of the transmission, then it means that you cannot raise customs duties on that product that is being electronically transmitted. And we know that now you don't need to buy a CD and get it imported inside your country in order to get that music. You just go and you download it and it's fine. You know, you get it. So you have a GATS commitment and you protect it there, but under the moratorium, you won't be able to leverage taxes with that. So that means that it changes the game, the, 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 the game that you already proposed on your GATS schedule. So we but, cannot say the moratorium is up for everything, just like let's renew it and let's not talk about what it includes and what happens. And we need to clear the rules about, and that's why some countries are raising the concern about the content the transmissions. They're saying, no, we don't want to include the content. We just want to renew the moratorium only on no le leverage of taxes on the transmission, but not on the content of the transmission. Because it changes what you already committed on the GATT. But I, I, I guess what I'm still confused. Like the, but there's a situation now that where you know there, there's no duties on tra the transmission. Um, and if it's just extended the, the way it has been, um, isn't that just keeping in line with the, the status quo of 1998? Right now, there's no, there's no a clear way of knowing what's inside the moratorium. I don't know, maybe my colleagues can stand on that. I wanted to copy yeah. that as well, so I so um, I think in Buenos Aires, Indonesia raised the issue of the content um, in that ministerial and whether that was covered, and so it's, I mean, when I look at it as a trade lawyer, it's ambiguous, and so there is no clarity. Um, and then, in terms of you know, who is who is on which side of this? I mean, as we as we went through, the those who are suffering the most from the loss of revenue are the developing countries and the LDCs. Um, and so there, there's some who may think, well, it's difficult to collect, so you know, what's the harm in renewing the moratorium? But what we can see is that it's possible to collect the same way that. Um, the big platforms, for example, are currently collecting value-added taxes on these electronic transmissions, as, as Sophia said. So we see, for example, that Australia, the EU, Iceland, New Zealand, Norway, Switzerland, 
they already charge value added tax on electronic transmissions. The way they do collect it is they get Amazon, Netflix, Spotify to collect it and remit it to them every few months. It's very simple, it doesn't cost much to collect. I mean, the platform will collect it for you. And the platforms even collect the taxes on electronic transmissions at the subnational government level. Like the city of Chicago imposes an amusement tax on electronically delivered amusement. Amazon collects it and delivers it to Chicago. Kentucky imposes a tax on video streaming. Amazon collects it and remits it to Kentucky. It's fine. You know, you just press checkout on Amazon and you pay the extra tax and Amazon sends the tax to the government. So it's not that it's expensive to collect. And this paper that's outside by Public Citizen actually has more on, on some of these issues. Um, and they have a second <coughs> paper outside with other useful materials that go into this in more detail. But some of the concerns that we've seen um, from other ministerial conferences is in terms of process, the way that some of these um, decisions can get rushed through. So uh, maybe not so much on the moratorium because it's a well-known issue, but we see these green rooms, these small group meetings of only certain countries in the room that negotiate a lot of the text, and then you know the heads of delegation get five minutes where they get an update, and those who weren't in the room can't can't make any changes to the text. And then in MC12 in, in Geneva, we saw that the text was gabbled through in the closing ceremony without many negotiators even seeing it. They didn't have the text. They came out to us after the closing ceremony on the driveway and said, do you have the text that we just agreed to? We were not provided with it. So this is just unacceptable and it makes the WTO look illegitimate. So it cannot be repeated here in MC13 as a way of forcing through any of the difficult um, decisions that are on the table here in MC13. Thanks. Jean, you also had some thoughts? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to broaden the moratorium question a bit as well because I, I do quite a lot of work in in small island states and small uh, and, and and quite um, uh, lower income developing countries where the reta local retail sector is an incredibly important part of the economy and the livelihoods and and what and I've been doing a lot of work in about the last nine months uh, with them and one of the things that I'm hearing almost everywhere is the impact on the small shop holders and so on of the increased amount of um, digitized material that is coming across and they are paying the local taxes and they're, they're trying to compete with these um, um, trying to, to, to work out the best way to describe them. The kind of more attractive, more accessible, more modernized, more uh, sexy uh, kind of products. Um, and, and linking back to what Daniel was saying about the national treatment issues, you know, the, the difficulties that there are in trying to look after those domestic sectors and to develop the input uh, elements to those uh, is, is a, a really important part of this picture. And I think we, we tend to look at the moratorium in fiscal terms, but it's actually really important the more from 1998 through to now you look at how much more there is, and if you look in five or ten years time, as to how much more there will be again, what are the real on the ground consequences uh, for many developing countries of ex extending the moratorium? But, but what about the... So could we, could we maybe, uh, go to some of the other people? Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll take the lady in the and then maybe... Yeah. I'll come to you later. No. Go, go ahead. I'm Paul Wayne. I'm a non-profit global innovation forum. And we represent 1,000 SMEs from around the world. And what we're hearing is that SMEs all want to go global. They want to do business internationally and across on different borders. And we're concerned that the, um, they love the uh, moratorium because it helps just you know doing business internationally. Uh, we do a lot of work with developing countries. We're is that a question? Um, well, it's a comment, a uh, comment and a question. We do lots of work with um, Pacific Island country of Niue, um, country of 1500. They're trying to export their honey internationally. They want access to markets. Um, we've been talking about you know every dollar, every euro that, or every minute of time that add complexity to SMEs to really make it break the business. So I'm just curious, um, you know, what are the impacts for, um, for SMEs that want to go global? How would it hurt? What's yeah, just so get before we get to that, could we also take one more question, maybe? Then you can look to yeah. 
Um, so my question is, uh, is this, what does the panel think about um, the implications of, of uh, the moratorium or just and, and everything accompanying regulation of global digital trade on issues like, uh, I'm going to pick just three fringe issues um, as an amateur also in this domain. So for example, uh, I'm, I, my name is Emmanuel Wachendo. I come from a think tank, a policy think tank in Kenya. And so, for example, I've observed that a lot of Kenyans were using, uh, were writing essays and doing homework for students in the United Kingdom and the United States in order to supplement uh, their income. And so they did this for many years. I think there's been attempts to, to regulate it, but it still seems to be going on. So they're able to buy cars, et cetera, right? And then also we see um, there is the stealing of textbooks. You know, Greg, Gregory Mankiw, that um, uh, renowned economist, you know, sells very, very expensive textbooks. So the alternative for these students is either to steal them or to buy the Indian low cost, uh, right? So then my question to the panel is then, how do you think this, the, 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 does the moratorium consider um, these, queer incidences and what does it, how is it actually, uh, what is it, its implication for that? Or is it going to build a wall between the third and the first world? Thanks. I want to, sure. I want to react first. Um, so there's two things. The first, about your question, the, the, the first thing is that there's this um, idea that if we don't renew the moratorium, all of a sudden taxes will start showing up. And this is not quite true. I mean, it's hard to put customs duties and, and it's not an easy uh, game inside a country in internal politics to start paying taxes. So there's this idea that if the moratorium all of a sudden disappears, taxes will appear all of a sudden and the world will become a more complicated place, you know, like when I don't think that's the case. I think that if we leave the space to make some policies, some countries might tax some things, but it's not the fact that all of a sudden everything in the internet will be more expensive and more complicated and whatever. So this is one thing. The other thing is that in order for MSMEs to export digital products and services, it's not only a customs problem. There's a lot of problems that have to be solved. You have logistical barriers, you have cultural barriers, you have in, the barriers of infrastructure, you have barriers of language, especially, for example, in the MSMEs in Latin America, which I talk to them all the time. So there's a lot of problems. There's connectivity issues, you know? There's, there's a lot of other problems other than just taxes. And I think tax, if I have to put all the problems in a in a chart would be the less problematic of all of them. Also, when you think about electronic transmissions within the international sphere, most of the electronic transmissions are done by big tech companies. They are not done by MSMEs. MSMEs generally, they jump inside a platform and they export inside the platform, but the actual electronic transmission is done by the, the Amazon. Or, or eBay, or whichever company it's given the service of managing that sale. So actually, this is not a problem for MSMEs. MSMEs have no problem with, with this type of tax. The problem is actually for big corporations, the problem is not a problem, it's a tax. But the tax is actually for big corporations, that they are the ones who are, who are doing the electronic transmission. You know, they're the ones who give the service to the MSMEs. And they can deal with taxes. I mean, they know how to deal with taxes. So I don't think it's such a big problem for MSMEs. Really, I don't, I don't generally see the problem for MSMEs if it's the moratorium is renewed or not, because it's not a problem that they face. You know, they generally, when you have an MSME exporting, they don't do it by their own means. They do it through eBay, through Amazon, through through Alis, through through some platform, you know? They don't just go to the internet and they sell their products. That's not happening. I mean, I mean, at least most of them, they're not. So, and especially in the global south, especially in the global south. So what I see that this is, um, 
if I have to look at it really uh, like trying to be really picky, what I see is that this is a big corporation's problem, that they are using the MSME's argument in order to oppose the moratorium because they don't want to pay taxes. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at it, it's like that, because really the one that is doing the electronic transmission and is doing the service and is doing everything is the big tech corporation, it's not the MSMEs. The MSMEs is just putting a product on the platform and packaging and selling it. That's what it's doing. So if you could go to G. Um, yeah. Part of what I've been doing in my research in the Pacific, for example, has been looking around the issues of tourism. And one of the problems that we have with the tourist sector is that the big players can afford to sell their product online. <coughs> they can afford to pay the commissions. They, have the, they can afford to deal with the visa uh, charges, etc. The small tourism operators simply cannot access and afford to pay for the big tech platforms that are the main um, tourism outlets now, whether we're talking about you know, Expedia or, or Bookings.com or whatever. Um, and a similar thing applies to uh, many of the SMEs, especially uh, a number of the women uh, co-ops and so on that, that I've been um, working with. What has been incredibly encouraging is that there are some local operators who have themselves bypassed the big players to develop their own local platforms, payment systems, delivery systems and so on, linked to the fact that they work with satellites and so on. And they have had to explicitly work out how to get around the big players and they are deeply concerned that both the control of their data, the rules that relate to payment systems and the um, ability to operate uh, across borders as they are now will be constrained by the kinds of rules that will be adopted uh, in the JSI or, or similar e-commerce um, um, uh, rule books that are designed to allow the expansion and consolidation of the oligopolies of the big players. And so it is a big issue, uh, but it's not an issue that's going to be resolved by um, these agreements, these agreements are going to make them worse. Um, so unless there are any last comments, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, all the panelists, and all of you as well. Um, I do hope that the discussion has given you some of the thought as you participate in our report on negotiations in the next few days. Thank you so much, all of you. And yes, there is lots of content outside, both on the e-commerce moratorium and various other aspects of uh, the GSI text. Do pay Thank you. Thank you.